Innovation Changes the World. This is a special presentation about the wider view how innovation works and part of the lecture how innovations change the world. Now, why do we new things? Why do we design new things, develop and invite, invent new things? Here is a very funny example. This is London, 1808, about 200 years ago. There was Richard, Richard Treflick, who built a circus called Catch Me. This Catch Me circus was a small place with a steam train inside. It was really the first steam train in the world and it was constructed in London and it was shielded against the peasants that they cannot see what's inside. And so they had to pay to enter this circus and they could see a lock and a small train with one carriage running around a circular track. That seems to be a little bit strange and if you paid a little bit more you even could drive in the carriage. Now what was it? Was it an invention? Was it an innovation? It was something that was not really perfect. It did go only in a circle. It was very slow, maybe 15 kilometers or even less. It was quite dangerous because this track were not perfect and the steam engine sometimes exploded. Really dangerous. The costs you had to pay only for watch it and it consumes a lot of coal, it produces a lot of smoke and by the way it was often broken. So is this really the thing that the world should change? Everyone thought no we don't need that. It is a little bit stupid. But today 200 years later we have high-speed trains bringing us from one place to another by 250 kilometers per hour. If we would not have a start, we would not have reached our level in this technology today. <coughs> so it is necessary that at the beginning there is someone crazy enough to do the start. Now let's look into another funny innovation. It is about 1809, oh, only one year later than this train stuff. It might have been a time of introducing new ideas and it was the electrochemical telegraph built by someone, Thomson von Sommering, and he was in Munich and his idea was to take a battery and to build something that you could wire information with, by the way, with the speed of light. And the left part was necessary to uh, type in the letters. No, actually it was not like a modern keyboard, but you could do that by pinning your wire to the right place. And on the left, right side you see the receiver station that was usually a hundred meters away. And it produced a little bulb of hydrogen and you could see it if you really watched carefully. And so you typed letter by letter and the receiver could read what you sent. Oh, and there was an interesting idea for the start of a conversation. You pressed the first four letters, a lot of hydrogen was produced and this small spoon was lifted, a small ball was falling into a ring and it gave a ringing noise. So even they invented the ringing. Was it really useful? It was extremely expensive by the way because um, 
cable wire expensive and all the other equipment were not off the shelf. You had only 100 meters of a range, so why don't you walk this 100 meters? It was very slow because you had to type letter by letter and it was difficult in the input and it was poorly legible. You had to be careful and it rarely worked. Sometimes one of the wires was broken or you had a shortcut or whatever. But the thing is, today we all use this type of communication on a much higher technology level. But if no one would have started that, we would still have to walk to give someone else the information. But luckily, in this case, Mr. Summering was busy designing something that was far ahead of his time, at least a hundred years. But if you don't have that team people, it won't work. Now look in, to another place in South Germany, in Mannheim. There was a guy called Karl Benz. He designed the first motor coach. And here we have an old advertisement from that day, 1886. What did he write in his advertisement? Always ready for immediate use. Uh, uh, you have to start the motor. That was quite a little bit more difficult than today. It is comfortable and absolutely safe. Now, I have some doubts about the safety of this car. Well, it wasn't very fast, so you might have a good chance to survive. Steering, holding and braking easier and safer. Be aware you even could brake. That was not very used at that time, because if you have horses, sometimes the horses don't brake if you call them so. You have very low operation costs. Yeah, you had to buy the <clears throat> gas line at the pharmacy. That was quite expensive, but yeah, if you were a rich person and could buy something like this, it was not so expensive. Complete replacement for cartridge and with horses. You did, don't need this old stuff. And saves the coachman the expensive equipment, maintenance and servicing of the horses. Really, that was expensive, but if you buy that, yeah, you start a new area. Today we are in a similar situation. There is a new technology coming in instead of the combustion engine. And we read with innovation and creativity, electric cars are better than gasoline cars. This was 12, 2012. It was the introduction of a Tesla Model X in Fremont in California. And there are a lot of people telling us that the battery is not perfect. It might be difficult to drive long distances. It is very expensive, of course. And no one needs it because we have already uh, this combustion engines. And so why to do something like that? That's the core problem in all these discussions. So now let's look a little bit back in history and understand what is going on when innovation comes and what are the laws behind that. So new discoveries are the topic. Here you see Columbus arriving in America. This was about 500 years ago and it was a discovery. And there is a deeper thing behind that because people started to try to discover the world. And today we are so used to that. We have all this research institutes discovering new laws in physics or technology. We have this traveling spaceships out in our solar system looking for new worlds. But at that day, people were not used to discoveries. They had the thought that everything is already known and only a very few people thought that uh, should something change, we should understand more. And one philosopher at that time, 
Francis Bacon, 1597, had the interesting statement in one of his essays. The goal of science is the control of nature in the interest of progress. But man could only control nature if he knew it. So he tells us that we have to use the science to control the nature and to bring things in the interest of progress. And Man could only control nature if he knew it, if he understands the things. And so, that is a big topic now, how to understand the world. And during this centuries after Bacon, a lot happened. And so, let's look into our state of the art of understanding the world. Today we see that in that time when Bacon came, the discovery of ignorance was happening. That is, as Yuval Noah Harari writes in his book Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, that the big change of our Western culture was that we discovered the ignorance, that we discovered we have to learn how the world works and that we are not perfect. We don't know everything from religious books because that does not help to construct new stuff. If you look into physics and mathematics, we see that we really learned a lot. During the last 400 years, we have learned the so-called Maxwell equations of electrodynamic Maxwell showed them 1864. And this set of equations, yeah, it's quite confusing if you're not used in physics, but I show them for telling you that it is the way we can describe most of our technology today. Everything that uses electric and mag uh, magnetic things you is in some way using this equation. That is the strongest set of equations human can highs today. More equations came in. Einstein wrote the theory of relativity, first for special relativity. This gave us a very interesting insight that energy and matter is very similar, very similar. So we understand how the sun can produce energy by changing the mass of the sun, by the way, 4 million tons per second. And Einstein showed us a, in, the, um, our, uh, in the other part of the relativity theory, the G KT, that is gravity, how gravity works and how space is formed and it gives us an idea how the universe is built. That is a very deep insight if we want to understand what happened during the last 14 billion years, what happened in the universe, building of and structuring of galaxies and so on. Then there came the last big invention of the 20th century that was Schrödinger and Heisenberg and some others, a lot of others, Feynman and all, with quantum mechanics. He showed by this equation how nature in detail works, how atoms and solid stuff, solid matter is organized. And we can calculate everything out what we need for modern chemistry, modern electronics, and modern little physics. This is very strong, so most of our products, beginning with our laptop and the processor, the storage of memory, and the transmission of information by lasers and light, all of this is based on quantum mechanics. Otherwise, it would not be possible to do all that what we do today. 
Here we see a problem. In some countries, there have been boundaries petrifying the situation. So things did not proceed. And the Islamic world had the letter press stopped till 1728 because the saying was if we know everything from our Quran we don't need to have printed books as Gutenberg developed in the 15th century in Europe. The Ming dynasty in China had also a very big border and did not like to communicate with the Western world and so they stopped the import-export till 1644. That stopped the culture development in this areas of the world. So the reason to do this change is that you want innovation. But the problem is it is not so easy as we think. And here is uh, Nietzsche who gave us an interesting sight. And he who must be a creator in good and evil, feral, he, he must first be a destroyer and break values. So you break values by doing all that we do in the West. We destroy a lot of stuff. The way we do that is very different and hard to understand in detail. So I go a little bit into that and we will see there are two ways to view on that. And I know this idea has done also worse work in Nazi Germany, for example. Events. We start in year 1912, the Titanic, the largest passenger ship in the world, her going over the Atlantic, sailing over the Atlantic on the highest speed ever seen, was directed into an iceberg. That let the ship sink and a lot of lives were lost. Some of them were rescued, luckily, and they had a chance because Wireless communication was already available at this ship, and so others could come to help. That is the chance for rescue. Otherwise, these people would have no chance, by the way. 1937, the Hindenburg ship did explode in near New York during a landing access and uh, touching a um, radio station. And so this technology and the information about this disaster was going around the world. There was a film team by the way there. So we have pictures, moving pictures from this disastrous event. And the technology was stopped. 1986, space shuttle. The Challenger explosion in Florida stopped at the concept of this space shuttle. It needed a second disaster until it was really stopped, but it is stopped nine years ago. And the last uh, event that stopped a lot of things was in 2011. This was a tsunami in Japan, in Fukushima and it had a death toll of 13,000 people. By the way, the people were killed by the tsunami. There was no loss of life due to the nuclear power station. But people, especially in Germany, were really scared about that event. And so in Germany, we stopped nuclear power for good or bad. I don't think that was a really smart decision. Now, what we really mean by destruction and um, how destruction helps to develop technology is explained by Joseph Schumpeter in his Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy, 1942. 
He writes the opening of new markets, foreign or domestic, and for organizational development from craft and factory to such corporations as the U.S. Steel illustrates the same process of industrial mutation. If I may use this biological, biological term, so mutation is one of the things that happens in nature and some animals get better than the others that is continually revolutionizing the economic structure from which, and now comes the decisive sentence, continually destroying the old structure and continually creating a new one. So destroying the old structure is part of the process. If you don't throw away the old stuff, there is no place for the new one. And this happens, and so I'll give you an example here. Here on top right we have an encyclopedic work. It is the Brockhaus, a German, but you have Encyclopedia de Britannica and a lot of other books that really contain such a lot of information. 25 books in this case. But no one would buy them today. There is the Sony Walkman, a wonderful idea to have a cassette recorder that you can pick with you during jogging and walking and driving the bus. There is the light that Edison gave us with the light bulb and it was lighting our industry, our houses and night and day in some way have changed fundamentally. And there is the catalog of Sears, of Quelle, of other companies where you could buy stuff by postal service. Now what happened? During the last decade all this has gone. If you want to order something online you might go to Amazon.com or you go to Alibaba if you are in China or you go to someone else who can sell you stuff. You don't need any more writing a letter and putting a post stamp on it. No one uses the old service. If you want to look into a book for understanding what this word and technology means, you usually don't pick the book. You pick Wikipedia and this is a place where millions of people wrote down information and it's just the real-time state of our knowledge of a world in one website. You have the smartphone. And the smartphone gives all the technology you need, for example, to play music, to see the time, to make a video, to take a picture, to do a lot of other things with one small product. And all the other products that you might see here as an icon have gone. And most of them have gone. And you see the LED. A light bulb of a much with a much higher efficiency, about ten times or more than the old Edison light bulb, only the uh, size is still the same. And it is based on quantum mechanics, by the way. Otherwise, we would not be able to do this. It is a very sophisticated process in physics to produce light out of electricity directly, not without the old way of producing that by the light bulb, where you mostly produce heat. Now let's have a look into this map of Germany, 8034. For Germany was not one country, it was divided into many small kingdoms and some of the parts were even not connected at all in the so-called Deutsche Zollverein. And if you want to travel from one end to the other, you had to do that by walking for weeks or months. And if you had luckily enough money, you had a very hard travel from one end to the other by a coach. And then in the year 1835, 1836, there was some guys in 
Nuremberg, a rich persons who built, a, who set up a company that built a track from Fürth to Nuremberg and that was the first iron way, the first train in Germany. And 37, the second attempt in Leipzig happened. And you see it popped out in always two towns with some relevance, for example, Potsdam and Berlin were connected, Oberau and Dresden, and soon you could ride some distance from Leipzig to Dresden, from Munich to Augsburg and to Berlin, and more and more came in and here and down in the Rhine Valley, the expansion was fast. And 86, 87, 88, let's have a short stop. The German democratic, first German democratic revolution happened due to this good connection of the people. And as times go by, you see more and more of the color is going yellow. The states united, um, the small kingdoms have gone to be part of this custom clearance system. And by the way, in the year 8070, there have been so many railroads available that you could drive just to every place. And for last 20 miles, you could walk. It was used, people were used to walk a big distance. But so in that time, Germany was completely connected by a grid of railways. And that is not only in Germany, that is in the United States, in England, in France, and in India, and all the other countries at the same time. That is very amazing. And by the way, it changed the way people live because the 1871, the German unification happened, the first unification. And if we go into details to understand what happens here, I have plotted the length of the railwork network in the world. So I um, added up all the railways in a different year. So 1830, we had about 200 kilometers of railway, more or less in Great Britain. And you have to look at the life left scale. It is a logarithmic scale. It's going from 100,000 to 10,000, 100,000 in a million. And within this fur, a small period of time, from 1830 to 1880, the size of the railway network doubled every five years. It is an exponential growth that is very typical for things of technology that are accepted and that have a big network effect. Now we should look into the influencing factors for this spreading and this fast spreading that we see often in technology. So te the first thing is we need a technology level in the society that allows to produce this. And as we have seen, 1808, the technology level wasn't at that level that it could spread the railway all over, for see, uh, example, Great Britain. But um, 20 years later, the technology was that far that they could start. And during this explosion, the technology quality rose very fast. Now we need another thing that is social acceptance. No technology can survive if the people don't like it. And if you build railways, that is a difficult thing. You have to go over the acres of other people and they have more or less to accept that. It was not easy, but people understood that it is better to have this railways and to use it. And it was widely used. And if something is widely used, the social acceptance gets really up. And you need cooperative societies. So as we have seen during this process, more and more parts of, in this case, Germany connected. And then 
the construction could go on because if you don't cooperate you will have borders and that the borders very well will stop actually it stopped only at rivers because that was hard to cross by bridges at that time and you need a financial basis that people have to have some wealth otherwise you have no money off for doing these installations and it seems so that the rich companies the rich countries are really the source for innovation because they have additional resources that they can waste in some way now look into another development here we see the development of a solar energy or to be precise the first silicon solar cell was done in 1954 in the Bell Labs in the United States. It was less than one watt of energy, but it was the same technology that you find today on gigawatts of solar cells. The first years, this technology was that expensive that it only worked in satellites and so. Um, 62, the first Telstar satellite used solar cells, the CUs in 67 used it, and the Skylab in 73. And then the growth was going on constantly, and look into the scale. We have a very strong logarithmic scale. Every main tick is a factor of 10. So we go from 10, a factor of 100,000, 10,000, 100,000, and reaching a billion, a trillion at least. That is the installation of solar cells today. We have reached about 5,300 gigawatt of power in 2019. This is a typically exponential growth, and we see this exponential growth very often. Now, let's have a deeper look into that. One of the exponential growths were you may be aware is the exponential growth of space on your hard disk. So hard disk is still today the most used technology to store huge amounts of data and what we have here is a chart that shows on the x-axis the production in terabyte, uh, collected all the production in terabytes and on the y-axis we see the megabytes price in dollars 1982. So if you go back to 1977, you see a hard disk price of about a little bit less than thousand dollars for a megabyte. And be aware, you have today a terabyte in your computer. So if you would buy that from this cost, it would be about one billion to buy a hard disk. That's incredible huge amount of money but the price was going down by as production widened and so if you double the production especially in hard disk you have a 40 54 percent reduction in the cost of the same product uh, this is a very steep line 54 percent that's not in every technology but it is widely that you see if you double the production you have at least 20 percent less cost and that widens the market and has a big impact because now if all the people can buy that the people will use it and society will change so this is the same plot for solar energy we have here the silicon price and we have the accumulated shipment in this case it's not megabyte it's a megawatt peak and you see the model costs in dollars per watt. So we go back 1976 and we see we have to pay about $100 for a simple one watt solar cell. And the price was going down and down and down. And it reached about 2000 already a low level. Um, there is a small bumper there, 2006, that was generated by the German program for supporting renewable energies so something has gone wrong it if you do if politically think they can influence the the long line they are usually doing just the wrong thing the solar cells have gone up in the price 
during the phase of strongly subsidizing it. That is a funny thing. But on the long term, um, things um, go back to the main track. And since 2006, we see even a steeper decay. And so maybe we'll see solar cells for 10 cent a watt. And today we are at 30 cent in 2019. The standard uh, explanation is we have 20% cost reduction, but I believe it's a little bit more. What is the reason that this cost production happens? And there is a, a feedback loop. And feedback is something that's very powerful. If you have, for example, a microphone and you talk into that microphone and you have a loudspeaker and the noise from the loudspeaker is coming to the microphone, it's getting louder and louder until you really have to care about your ears. So here, what happens here? The solar production, the production of solar cells um, is starting. And then the market absorbs uh, these cells for whatever price. And for beginning, you have areas where it is very needed, for example, in space technology. But due to that, that this is absorb, absorbed, New factories will be built, new technology will come in, the production is more efficient, you have low production costs, and if you have low production costs, you can sell them cheaper. And then the market widens, because now more people have a chance to buy that. And so this is spiraling, always more production, less price, more market. And this spiral is the reason for this so-called learning curve as we have seen in two examples of the hard disks and the solar cell, and also more or less at the um, railway. Now, this, this um, acceleration can be measured. And so there is an um, interesting idea. It was written in Linhardt's book about how invention begins, that you calculate how long it needs that a new product is doubling its users. So after some years, you have uh, double the number, or to be precise in this formula, it's exponential. Um, so the factor is 2.7, but that doesn't matter too much. <clears throat> and the time constant at the beginning is, um, yeah, beginning of this uh, plot is 1600. And the first products had um, time constant of about 37 years. So this time constant is not a constant since 1850. About 1850, things started to change. And what was the reason? Because there have some things changed in the world. We have seen that technical universities came in, that engineering was happening. So specialized people to optimize products before that was not available. And now you had from the technical universities thousands of engineers and every one of them tried to make things really better. Then you have education for all peoples that helps to bring products to the market and open the eyes of people because they see that you might have a brighter future if new technology is introduced. You have enlightenment. People are not only relying on religion, they understand that a lot of things can be done by technology, for example, medical care. You have a railway network starting at that time, so communication is much easier, distribution of products is much easier, and the market volume is growing, because if more people have work and you have a more efficient production, then the market is growing. And the number of people in Europe, by the way, and in the United States were growing very fast at that time. It was some type of uh, population explosion um, that is uh, today happening in what was happening during the last decades in Asia and um, Africa. So the market is still growing. And we are now in, in, a, in a cycle time for sometimes up to a year or less. That means some products, look at Facebook, for example, it did need only months until the number of Facebook users doubled. And sometimes of course, they are getting in saturation, but uh, then new products come in and you see that every day. And so you have your WhatsApp and you have your 
Instagram or whatever is just um, coming into the market, uh, look into artificial intelligence, something similar is happening. Now, look back to that time, uh, 1817. So what is here written is the top companies in Germany, that is the DAX, uh, the stock exchange, and they count the 30 most valuable, more or less valuable um, companies. And we can look when they were founded. And uh, by the way, the oldest company in Germany is Deutsche Post and Deutsche Telekom that are this uh, communication organization. They started in 1490s, so they are over 500 years old, by the way. But uh, most of them were started in 1870. So look that. Uh, you see uh, Bayer, Siemens, BSF, Linde, Henkel, and Daimler, and a lot of more companies. They were all set up during the phase when the Industrial Revolution took off in Germany. And since 1900, the number really trickled down, and today we don't have too much new huge companies coming into the market. The only really innovation was SAP in 1972, but since this time we have seen a new company technology based. That is a sad thing for Germany. Is that true for everywhere? No, it is not. So we look into the United States. Also in the United States, a lot of companies have built and set up in the year around 1870. So we see some names we know, like American Express, Pfizer, Goldman Sachs, Chevron, Johnson & Johnson, and Coca-Cola, of course. But in the 20th century, there are new and more new companies coming in, like Intel and Microsoft and Apple and Cisco. You all know them because Intel is within your computer, the microprocessor. Microsoft is for everywhere software and Apple is your mobile phone and Cisco you might haven't seen that but behind the scene it is doing the work for navigating you through the internet that is um, one of the big companies and so there are some more um, but not all of them are technically driven so McDonald's is more a consumer product and a Home Depot is something like that. So we can do a um, comparison by drawing a graph where we show the age of our companies accumulated. So the left scale is how many companies were founded in a year, usually one or nothing. Uh, in some years there have been even two big companies founded and so you find between 1850 and 1900, some years where two significant companies have been founded. That's quite amazing. And that isn't happening in the last 100 years, so that's a sad thing. And if you compare the two plots, the black plot is a German line and the blue plot for American line, you see the American line is a little bit more smooth and it's still not really ending. And if I could add new companies like um, Google and Facebook and Amazon, you will see that um, the, the plot is going on and on. In Germany, it seems that since the last 100 years, um, the plot has more or less stopped. It's not going up anymore, or only very, very slightly. That is a difference in the innovation uh, activity in different countries. So what are now the reasons why innovation works? And so we have to look into that because we need innovations and there is a list of what could be done, done to promote innovations. And there are, uh, is a short list that might be interesting. And the first is you need education. If people are stupid, they can't do anything new and you have to support people learning stuff. You need universities. You need technology promotion. People should understand what's going on in technology. You should present that. You need incentives to implement the technology. Maybe you can support it for small companies with a little money and a little help from the state or other organizations. If you have new products, you could have another thing that you ask for very high level of technology, extreme demands on the products, 
as for example for a mobile phone, you need fantasy. For example, this nice picture here. What the people did here is they used electricity and to show how interesting electricity is, they built a waterfall that is not very useful, but it is a good way to think beyond what happens. And uh, this was driven by this exhibition was driven by Ludwig II, the king of Bavaria. So the people have to be wealthy and you need some crazy people, people going beyond what's normal because normal is not usually helpful if you want to go into innovations. You need really thinking out of a box. Now look to some examples. So one thing was, for example, in Munich, the Polytechnic School in Munich that was founded in 1868 and was upgraded to a university in 1877. And so famous people then, Karl von Linde um, and Rudolf Diesel worked there. Karl von Linde is the inventor of a fridge and so could cool your food. And if we don't have that technology, we even would have big troubles to have a food supply if you are not able to cool down the stuff. And a diesel, the inventor of a diesel engine, is today the driver of the world market. If you look into the ships, into the trucks and uh, some cars, and also railways, you find this diesel engine. So without this two men, we, the world would be very different. And it was founded, supported by founding a technical university. A technical university is a university that is supporting technology and is not uh, only on the old things like philosophy and theological uh, things. That is um, a big change and it this change happened during the 19th century. So now about extreme products. So <laughs> let's have this look at this waterfall and this cliff here. And if I ask someone um, 150 years ago, you should build a bridge from left to right. It's about 90 meter here. You can't do that by wood. Then that was an exorbitant difficult task. Actually, the people could do that. They had found a way to build a bridge above this uh, valley and it was done 1866 and it was completed with a new type of uh, supporting armor it was a steel bridge and a new way to do the construction and so if no one had asked it that this new technology would not have arrived the technology arrives if you ask for difficult tasks that is the way you learn to make the world better so the bridge is, by the way, still there, and if you want to go there, uh, you can walk over it. Now, another funny thing is this um, a king, a very king for a second, uh, was a little bit a crazy person. And so he asked it for a bluish blue. It should be more blue than all other blues. Uh, he wanted his grotto in Linderhof to be very blue. And so, because he had um, asked it for that, and we had a big prize who can solve the problem. Um, uh, Caro, Mr. Caro developed a chemical, uh, developed the dye methylene blue. And by the way, as he started the company, the company is today still here. That's BSF, Badische Analine and Soda Factory in Ludwigshafen. At that time, it was a Bavarian area. And uh, a year later, Adolf von Bayer at the Ludwig von Maximilian University, also in Munich, uh, succeeded to have indigo. So that's the color, by the way, your blue jeans is today. Your blue jeans color is uh, direct um, related to this um, king, <laughs> by the way. So, but you can have also dreams that are beyond that, for example, a flying machine. And so this is six, 1868, a flying machine, but um, the people had an idea how to do that, but they had not the technology to convert for energy. Uh, you see um, a steamboat uh, in the sea, in the lake here, but the um, energy was not dense enough for driving an airplane. It needed another 40 years until the first airplane lift off, and that was not here, it was in the United States, the brother Wright. So, what type of culture do you need to go beyond what's happening? Uh, one of these cultures 
is the so-called hippie culture that arrived in the 60s in the United States, especially in California, where people ask it for other things than only buy me a big car. They ask it for flower power, for make peace, not war, and something like that. And they tried really new styles of life, living on a farm, producing your own food, doing whatever was not done during that time, and trying to make things better on, on your own. One guy, or some people of that uh, period should be mentioned, and so at the left you see this woman, that is John Bass, she is a singer, and she was a girlfriend uh, from Steve Chops, by the way. And they had a lot of discussions what to do in this world. And near uh, John Bass is a man who is a Nobel laureate. He won the Nobel Prize. And you might know him as Bob Dylan, a big musician and lyric. And so look to John Bay, uh, to Steve Jobs now. Um, his father was a Syrian refugee and uh, he had no parents. He has a steep parents and he get wealthy by producing this Apple PC together with Watsonak, who was a great designer for computer technology, uh, but um, Steve Jobs was a big guy to do the marketing. And now they're getting really wealthy with this, um, and he has be fi he's been fired from Apple, by the way. He started uh, some years later and invented the iPhone. And the iPhone is uh, a groundbreaking technology that gives us today this way to communicate and to have always a computer with us. But it needed extreme change because you have to bring a whole computer within a small box that is not trivial because all the other companies like Nokia and Siemens and who have there, they're not able to do something like that. You need a person who is going beyond the borders, who is thinking beyond the time. Here's Elon Musk. You might have heard of him, uh, but he is he's also a strange guy. He is uh, coming from South Africa, and then he fleed his parents. By the way, he has uh, very, <laughs> very interesting parents. They usually, if they had a weekend trip, they took their, their own plane and have gone somewhere inside of Africa and <laughs> stayed there, as this family picture shows you. Left, you see him at studying in uh, Canada. And then he has gone illegal to United States and he started a company that built PayPal. PayPal, uh, that's the way you pay today your internet stuff. And so he, he gets really rich by that. And after that, he had enough money to do his thing and to build an electric car. Electric car could be done at that time. No big company did that. Oh, there was one example where a company did that for Chef Bolt, but they stopped the program. Elon Musk did not stop the program. He introduced the Tesla car, and so he's very successful now. And he is also building SpaceX, and you have seen that the first American rocket that brought astronauts to the sta space station has started, and that means America is again able to bring astronauts into space. <laughs> that is all of the same person that did the electric car and did the PayPal. So one person, great ideas, and that is the thing that we need for innovation. So now look into the German approach of promoting innovation. Um, that's not the best success story we can have. So I have to look a little bit into the education program in Germany. It was very good. Um, in the former times, now we have three le years less of education. We have a called G8. That means we have one year less in um, high school. And we have a bachelor program instead of our German diploma. That was a great success story. But now we don't have that anymore. Technology promotion is not really working. It is usually money for large industries. It's a type of subsidize for large industries. It's not the way that it should be it should be money for small companies uh, with the real new ideas but it's difficult to bring that from a state organization to that we need venture capital here we need 
incentives to implement a new technology. A new technology only can work if you if there are not too many hurdles at the beginning because the really hard thing is to build the technology and then if you were to block it with another stone on the road it may not even start. So what we are talking about in Germany is data protection, privacy, environmental requirements and so on and so if you want to start a company like Google in Germany you will fail because you cannot really solve the problem of for example privacy. You should have extreme demands on your product, see the Apple uh, mobile phone, the iPhone, uh, but what we are talking always is a continuous improvement of process. So if you have a continuous improvement of process, you will always stay with your old telephone. You might change the color or you might have um, a little bit easier dialing, but you never will end up with an iPhone. So continuous improvement has its advantages and stabilized products, but in if you want to see new products and innovations, that's not the way we find innovations. We have to go into extreme demands and extreme products. We need fantasy. So we talk about political correctness and you should not go too far away from the standard thinking. You need wealth. Um, yeah, Germany has a high tax and so a lot of people have gone away because the tax is too high. And we need crazy peoples. Uh, like uh, someone like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or all the others. And um, so we are asking, is this really a normal people? Should it not go to the clinic and have some psychology support? Yeah, that's not the way you start support these people. If you do that and you look into the German thinking, you find a very interesting thing. I have uh, compared the two words uh, search in Google and the one search is for sustainable or Nachhaltigkeit as we call it in German and Nachhaltigkeit is more and more searched in the German Google and if you look for innovation then you see the curve is going down and it's about half as it was 10-15 years ago. That is not a good development. If you look into innovations, we will also see that innovations come in two types. There is one type that is very technical, very physical and isolated. That is the start of most of the innovations. At the beginning, they are used for space travel, for nuclear power, genetic engineering and stuff like that. That is not gone bright in the society. But then things change and the development direction is that things go more or less into the society. So the car was first for some few tech guys, now everyone has one. Um, the, uh, the car, the pill, uh, the solar power, all of that was at the beginning high tech and now it's everyone's tech. So we have Wikipedia, everyone can write in their Facebook, we have, we have um, school and so times are changing and we need this change, we need the innovations to solve the problem of our planet. Our planet has many problems, I, I named five of them, maybe you can find more of them and we can always ask what is the innovation that can stop the problem. So one is overpopulation, we have more people on the earth that are easy to feed and um, to stop that we need um, birth control and the pill is one of his great ideas to do that and then we'll have a stable population maybe until 2030. Um, actually the reason why we still have a growing population is not because we have so many children, the reason is uh, because people are getting older and older and if you have a lot of people that um, live not only 50 years, uh, then they live 60 or 70 years as today, then you have more people on the planet. That's a good thing because now people can get have a healthy life and much more decades. Um, we have a global dimming problem. That means during the mid of the 20th century there was so much dust in the air that the sun was dimming. New filter technology arrived and we had uh, now a 4% brightness gain in the last 10 years in most of the countries. 
Um, we have a blue sky here in Germany again. That was not always the same as it is. I remember as a children, that was a big topic because things get really dirty. If you live near a um, power plant or something else that produces a lot of dust. Violence, a big, big problem in the world. Maybe communication helps, but actually what we see, the number of murders is going down in the last 15 years it was halved in Germany at least and we see on a global scale that violence is reduced Okay, you see the news and if you look into the news you will see always someone who is violent But that's because the news like to show you violence because the people like to see violence But uh, they don't want to feel it and um, if you look into the book of Steve Pinkert, he tells us that really the situation has improved over the last centuries and even over human history. Peak oil, see carbon. Um, the carbon problem and the problem of burning fossil fuel is a huge one because it gives us the climate change and that will be a huge problem. We can solve it by technology, maybe renewable energies or nuclear power um, with new technologies. And today we have about 1000 gigawatt wind and solar already installed. We need at least 10 times that much, but if you have an exponential growth here, you will see that we can solve that problem by innovation. And diseases, one of the worst thing human has, and you know the coronavirus in the moment is a big problem. But we can bet on medical progress. We know that we have a genetic tools to understand what's going on. That's very different for hundreds of years ago. People had no idea that people were dying. That was a really, really bad situation. Today we know the background. We know that there's a virus. We know the DNA of that virus or the RNA of that virus. We can produce vaccines. And we can do that very fast. Maybe within one or two years we have a vaccine. And today we have already the tests, the test kits for checking if you are um, have a, check, got the COVID-19 and so on. This is um, not only this is a special virus. It is all over our um, health system. And so life expectancy grows by three months every year. So the global life expectancy is growing every year, three months. That's great. And so I wish you a bright future and thank you for your attention.